I would like to say a little bit about Dr. Jackson to give you a, a flavor for who he is and how many things he's accomplished. And it's impossible to say a little bit about him because his accomplishments are extraordinary and extensive, and his CV is well over 45 pages. So let me just give you some brief glimpse of what he's done and what he's accomplished. And first of all, I'll start by saying that he is the Daniel Katz Distinguished University Professor of Psychology. He is also the Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education in the School of Public Health. And he is also the Director and Research Professor of the Institute for Social Research, all at the University of Michigan. Now, I'm a department chair, and I can hardly manage all of the meetings that I am supposed to attend. I don't know how he does it in these three different capacities. So I need to get some time management skills from him or, or figure out how he does it. Uh, on the national scale, he is currently president-elect of the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues a member of the advisory committee to the director of the National Institutes of Health, a member of the Aging Society Network of the MacArthur Foundation. He was a member uh, for the council work group for priority setting for the basic sciences of mental health at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And so that's also very important. A lot of us get, get grants through NIMH, and he's set, helping to set the priorities. He has served as chair of the section on social, economic, and political sciences at the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, known as AAAS. He is the former chair of the section on social and behavioral sciences of the Gerontolo Gerontological Society of America and the Committee on International Relations and the Association for the Advancement of Psychology of the American Psychological S Association. So that just gives you a brief overview of his incredible professional service to all of us who uh, conduct science. He is, needless to say, the recipient of numerous awards, and I'm just going to look at some of the most recent ones. Starting in 2005, he received the Distinguished Service Award from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. In 2007, he received the prestigious James McKean Cattell Fellow Award for Distinguished Career Contributions in Applied Psychology from the Association for Psychological Sciences. This was followed in 2008 by two special awards. First, a presidential citation from the American Psychological Association for dedicated research, scholarship, service, and leadership to the discipline of psychology. And second, a Health Disparities Innovation Award from the National Institutes of Health. He is also a previous recipient of the Distinguished Career Contributions to Research Award from the Society for the Psychological Study of Ethnic Minority Issues of the American Psychological Association, and earlier in his career, an award for Distinguished Early Career Contributions to Psychology in the Public Interest. Dr. Jackson's research focuses on issues of racial and ethnic influences on life course development attitude change, reciprocity, social support, and coping and mental health among blacks. His research has resulted in numerous books. This is where the 45 pages come in, numerous books, scientific articles, and chapters. Over the last 30 years, he has been the principal investigator on over two dozen funded NIH and NSF grants and is currently directing the most extensive social, political behavior, and mental health and physical health surveys on the African American and Caribbean populations ever conducted. Not just one, three. And they're entitled The National Survey of American Life the Family Connection Survey Across Generations and Nations, and the National Science Foundation and Carnegie Corporation supported national study of ethnic pluralism and politics. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jackson, who will speak on the self-regulation of health behaviors, the environmental affordances framework. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, 
The reason why I can do the things in time management is not an issue is because of all those names of the people that you see up there. Uh, these are all part of my colleagues. I've been very fortunate over my nearly 40 years at the, at the University of Michigan um, to have some wonderful students. I also noticed that I share with the Gavins a passion, um, although not an expertise, um, with regard to airplanes, um, which I thought that was very, very um, uh, appropriate too. I didn't tell them I started my career in electrical engineering, actually, um, but once arriving at Michigan State to become an electrical engineer, I decided that it really didn't suit my personality and wound up in psychology instead after a couple of years. Um, but it turns out that actually, I, although I'm not going to talk about that, um, I'm doing more and more research that relates to engineering, particularly in the area of energy uh, and nanotechnology and other issues as we look at um, extending the social and behavioral sciences in new directions. In some ways, I could talk a lot about what I'm not going to talk about um, because a lot of the things that were mentioned in the introduction that I do, whether it be on politics or family issues or other kinds of things, or even the National Savior of American Life, I'm not going to really talk about that. I'm going to talk about some of our new kind of conceptual um, uh, research that really tries to account for um, things that we've been observing over the last 30 years um, in our research on the African American population. Uh, I'll warn you before we get into it, uh, some of this is controversial, uh, but I will call your attention to uh, the parts that are controversial. Before I get to it, it'll say controversial and it'll light up and stuff, and we'll, we can talk about that as we go along. But the roots of, um, of this, the genesis of this talk, actually reside in three very different kinds of realms. So before I tell you what I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about the genesis of this particular talk. The first realm relates to issues with regard to mental health statistics. So these are admission studies that have gone on for a long time, beginning in 1840, um, all the way up uh, to 1989 or so. And these are all the people that have looked at the issue with regard to the nature and distribution of mental disorders. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that. And most of these studies were done on populations um, that we call populations under treatment. So a very common finding, this is 1989, a very common finding uh, was that African Americans were disproportionately represented among people with serious mental disorders in all different types of hospitals. Um, so that in some ways, as I call it, everything was right with the world. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that because African Americans should have uh, higher rates of mental disorders given the kind of lives in which they had. And in this early research, we indeed saw that to be true. But remember, these are not household prevalence studies, a point I'm going to come back to make. Even if we look at in involuntary admissions by race and state, you can see that the overwhelming numbers of people uh, um, that African Americans were disproportionately likely to be admitted on an involuntary basis across the various different states. Again, this is from uh, 1989, where ratios range from um, about 1.7 all the way up to 4.8 to 1 uh, in Florida. Uh, and again, it all was right with the world. It was this graph, though, uh, which really prompted um, the work that I'm going to talk about today uh, some 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, this is a study that came from the epidemiologic catchment area study. And this was a study which was one of the first kind of representative studies which looked at the distribution of psychopathology within households. Because the problem with regard to looking at the distribution of psychopathology of people who are under treatment is the fact that how did people get into treatment? And one had to look at what indeed may cause that. This was a big revolution, the development of instruments and things which could try to judge uh, psychopathology based upon household samples. Now, what was interesting about this, so this figure sat in this book that came out, I think, in 1991 for almost 20 years with no comment, with no comment. But what it shows is that non-Hispanic whites' rates for major depression is higher than the rates for African Americans. And as you're going to see later, every single study that's ever been done, on either national or large representative regional studies, 
find exactly the same thing. The rates of serious mental disorders, particularly anxiety disorders and major depression, is higher among the non-Hispanic white populations than it is among African Americans. All is not right with the world. So if we look at then, this is the second thing <coughs> that kind of graded on me, and this is going to be important. This is from Robbins, where she looked at rates of alcohol disorders. And again, it came from the ECA study, uh, and this was 1989. And what's interesting about this is the differences in different age groups with regard to what the rates are. So if you look at African-American males, that as they enter older ages, that indeed the rates are higher than those who are in younger ages, while the absolutely opposite pattern happens with regard to non-Hispanic whites. Robbins explained this particular effect by the fact that this was a cohort effect, that the people that they measured in 1989 who were born and raised way back here always had higher rates than the people who were here who now had lower rates. But in some ways that didn't make any sense, and that was kind of unsatisfying. So these are the, this is the, the kind of the first source of what this talk is really about. How do we make sense out of these particular data? And I'm going to come back to this um, in, a, in a minute. The second thing is this quote, a mind is a terrible thing to lose. That quote really struck me about the issue with regard to motivation and so on. And I know that all of you probably think Freud, Pogo, you know, what philosopher <coughs> made this particular comment. It was actually uttered by Vice President Dan Quayle, if you remember that particular quote. And of course, Dan Quayle, who was always getting himself in trouble with his mouth, uh, said this. Um, it's a misquote of the United Negro College Fund banner, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. All right? But I've come here to vindicate Vice President Quayle. We'll come back to this at the end of the talk, because as it turns out, he in inadvertently was absolutely very right as we think about the notion with regard to self-regulation of particular behaviors that relate to physical and mental health. So I appreciate that from Quayle. The third strand that I want to talk about comes from the arts. Well, kind of the arts. Uh, those of you who may know Janet Ivanovich, of course everybody's going to deny that in this room because who reads these particular kind of novels? These are really kind of trashy novels you read on the airplane. So Janet Ivanovich, which I, I dearly love, I've read every novel she's ever written because she's really hilarious. Uh, her main protagonist is Stephanie Plum. And Stephanie Plum is a bail bond enforcer who probably shouldn't ever have got into that because she's always getting herself in trouble. Somebody's threatening her life, they're breaking into her apartment, they're blowing her car up, all these things are happening. And in response to this, she's constantly eating donuts, cakes, pizza, and similar kinds of comfort foods. And in fact, the author, uh, Ivanovich, says her wish in life is to eat cheese doodles and Krispy Kremes and never get fat. And if she could do that, she would be very happy. This is the third strand of the talk that I'm going to talk about today. And the purpose of my talk is to bring these three things together in a framework that explains some very peculiar data that's true in the epidemiologic literature. So the outline of my presentation, this is, for, this is for some of the students in the group. You know, so a good talk is generally, you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So I'm not going to deviate away from that. So the outline of my talk today, I'm going to talk about the social determinants of poor health. How do we understand that? Uh, the law of small effects and race disparities, and I'll explain that to you. We're going to talk about race and race differences in opportunities that exist. We're going to talk about poor structured conditions of life by race, the ways in which housing arrangements and other arrangements are oftentimes organized by, um, by race in this society. We're going to talk about constant environmental stressors and stress. The main culprit in this whole talk is all about the issue with regard to stress and the ways in which it has effects on us. And I'm going to talk about environmental affordances, and I say this uh, with, with due homage to um, um, Oh, just that quick, it went out of my mind. Anyway, I'll come back to it. Um, for unhealthy coping strategies. I'm going to talk about the chronic activation of the stress network, that is the HPA axis, which is the uh, mechanism, which we think is very, very important in accounting for what we observe. We'll talk about poor health behaviors used to cope with stress. 
ensuing physical health disparities and disorders because of that, and the protection from mental health disorders because people do these things. All right? So disparities. Disparity is a very, very difficult thing to understand. And anybody who tells you is very simple. All differences are not disparities. There are differences that we see among groups which are actually caused by things that indeed may be legitimate. That is, cultural preferences of a particular group or other kind of differences that we may observe. Differences that we talk about with regard to disparities are those that indeed uh, arise from uh, biases and prejudices and stereotyping and uncertainty and systematic discrimination of one group of people over another group of people. That's what disparities are about. Disparities are not simply differences between groups. They really are differences which arise because of these kind of illegitimate sorts of things. And that's very important to keep in mind. So what do we know about social inequalities in health? There's a ton of work in this area. And people like Marmot and others have talked about that, and I'm going to just run through this very quickly. So they talk about issues of power, social participation, social environment, behavior, and early life, all being important as to why we might observe disparities in individuals in adulthood. And this is Marmot's model. I use it as a straw man, but what could be wrong with this model? There's, there's nothing wrong with this model. It has everything in it, early life, it has genes, it has culture. It has a social environment. It has social structure. Look at all of those things. It has pathophysiological changes, which somehow may indeed work between all these things that have the effect out here. The only thing wrong with this, of course, is how do you get testable hypotheses out of this particular kind of mishmash? But this is the model that you see a lot in the work in terms of social inequalities and health. And in fact, we know a lot of this data from the Marmot people. It's very interesting. If we look at the gradient um, um, with regard to mortality, uh, such that those people who are indeed in uh, better um, 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 uh, straits with regard to jobs tend to have lower levels of mortality than the people who are in lower levels of jobs. In the PSID, which is the Panel Study of Income Net Dynamics, which has been going since about 1968, we can see that indeed mortality is graded by income. So you are actually better off if you live in higher income households. The rate of mortality among people who live in these kinds of households is much better than people who live in poor households. This is even true with regard to um, at the aggregate level, although there's a lot of arguments about this. But indeed, those states which indeed tend to have a smaller proportion um, with regard to um, uh, the income share in the United States tend to have higher rates of mortality in those states, which indeed have higher shares. So you even get it at the aggregate level, although there are issues with regard to ecological fallacies and other kinds of things. But it goes along with the individual data. The second thing I want to talk about is race. Race matters even if we don't know what it is. Now, I take this from Cornell West, for those of you who know, Brother West, who made this particular point. But the fact is that race really matters in this particular and it's independent of a lot of other kinds of things. And let me just show you some data to make this particular point. So if we look at the differences between 1968 and 2000 with regard to life expectancy at birth, while indeed there's been some secular change such that it goes up for everyone, there's still wide differences between African Americans and non-Hispanic whites. Infant mortality rates have shown similar secular changes with regard to decreases over time for everyone, but there's still stubborn differences between African Americans and non-Hispanic whites. If you think it's just because of class, this is a very interesting set of data. So this is pregnancy-related mortality um, from women, the mothers, in Michigan, which is aggregated over the period 1990 to 1998. And what's really interesting is the, the largest ratio, the largest differences, is actually found at the highest levels of education. So it's more educated black women who are at, more, at higher risk for mortality than lower educated black women. This is adjusted by age, by the way, because that's an easy explanation for the effect. But the effect is, is it's not just simply something to do with regard to social economic status. Race matters. This is the probability of surviving from age 15 to 65 among US blacks and whites, 
Uh, this is U.S. white males. This is poor white males. This is U.S. black males on average, and this is poor black males. And so you can see that there is clearly an interaction here between race and class with regard to survivorship. There are two perspectives on race which are important. Self-reported race is the most common use measure of race in both social and biological research today. It's the most common used way in which we assess race. We ask people, what is your race? You tell us what your race is, then we put it down. Right? That's the most common way in which it's done. Nobody takes biological measures and does genetic assays and so on. Well, sometimes they do. But for the most part, we don't do that. So the question is, what in the world would a person's self-identity have to do with regard to the differences? So sometimes when I give this talk, I tell people that I ran across this guy, Joe, somebody outside, and Joe said to me, James, you're white. And I said, I didn't know that. I said, I'm 65, and I swear to God, I thought I was black all this time. So now I'm white. So from now on, whenever I do anything like this or my health things and so on, and they ask me what my race is, I'm going to tell them I'm white. So now I'm going to live seven more years than I was going to live than five minutes ago when I said I was black. And that's a very silly, I know it's a very silly example, but that's exactly what we have here. What in the world? would a person's identity have? And we never ask any questions about that. We aggregate groups on their self-identity as either black or non-Hispanic whites, and then we look at those aggregate differences, and we see huge differences, eight and nine years in mortality. We see huge differences with regard to diabetes, with everything else and so on. What does identity have to do with that particular issue? So one way of thinking about this, if and for those of you, the social psychologists in the group, I fess up, I'm a social psychologist. So as a social psychologist, you can sell that from this figure, because the whole world can be construed into a two-by-two two table. <laughs> and then, you know, social psychologists learned that the first year you're in graduate school. If you can't learn that, then you can't become a social psychologist, right? <laughs> so there are two ways to look at this. There are self-perceptions. That is, I can say, yes, I'm black, or I can say, no, I'm not black. And then there are other perceptions. The observer can say, yes, you're black. Or the observer can say, no, you're not black. What's interesting about this table is that the only thing that non-Hispanic whites and African Americans have kind of um, colluded on over the 400 years has been who is black. Because African Americans say, yes, we're black. And whites say, yes, you are black. Very easily. So it doesn't matter whether it's about your self-identity or it's about the other, which observes you with regard to the particular characteristics. And while we think we might try to get to be in a post-racial way, if I really ask everybody in this room to divide people and people who are black or African-American and divide people who are white, you could do that in about 10 seconds. You could divide the room. Well, why? Because there are characteristics that people have that we use to make judgments on people's racial categorization. So I don't need to come up to you and ask you, are you black, before I discriminate against you. I can just look at you, and I know, and then I can discriminate. So what that opens up then for blacks, and every one of these other tables, every one of these things, race is contested. So you tell someone who is Afro-Caribbean from Jamaica, and you say you're black, the person says, no, I'm not black. I'm Jamaican. I'm not, I'm not going into that category. Right? You talk to Asians or you talk to other kinds of groups. That's what's interesting. And for every one of these groups that's off this particular, di uh, off this particular diagonal, disparities jump all over the place. They jump all over the place. For Hispanics, for example, even some of them, have better mortality outcomes than do the non-Hispanic white population. The Hispanic paradox, for example. There's a reason for that. And this is the reasons that we're trying to get at with this particular framework. So race and chronic stress are very important. And the chronic stress process can play out as one possible pathway for why you observe physical and mental health disparities among racial and ethnic groups. I don't need necessarily to 
to know uh, a person's race, I mean, I don't need to know. I can just make attributions based on my observations, and then the chronic stress process can work out. So discrimination is important. Um, discrimination operates in the context of larger social, political, economic, and cultural influences. And there's a lot of research, not, we've done some of this research, which shows that discrimination and perceived racism probably play a very important role in the kind of health outcomes that we see. The law of special of small effects says this. There is no one single factor that produces observed physical health disparities among race ethnic groups in the United States. There's no one single factor. There is no home run. It's not because of genes. And I, can, I sometimes give a talk on why it's not genetic, um, but it's, it's not simply genes. It's not simply social class. It's not simply cultural issues and so on. What it is, is a group of small differences which accumulate over the life course. Small differences which accumulate over the life course and they produce these observed differences, big differences in adulthood and older ages among different race and ethnic groups. Controversy one, actually. I'll get to that. So there are a lot of candidates for what what produces this? Gene, gene, and gene environment interaction, discrimination, life course selection, which I think is very, very important, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. Cultural factors play a role. Behavioral differences play a role. SES and institutional arrangements play a role, as well as accumulated treatment differences over time play a role. Social and psychological factors play a role. Culturally and environmentally mediated behavioral coping strategies also play a role. It's not easy to parse these things out and to assign some variance accountability to these things with regard to the observed disparities that we see. They interact over the life course. Blacks disproportionately, in comparison to non-Hispanic whites, are materially disadvantaged and geographically segregated. This is just some data to make that particular point. African Americans make up about 12% of the population. They make up 6% of the highest income fifth and they make up a full fifth of the lowest income fifth. This is from 2004. The unemployment rate, if I had numbers for today, it would be even worse. So over this particular period, 72 to 2003, it's a stubborn difference, and that difference is still there on average. If you look at median net household worth from 1989 to 2001, it's gone up from $5,300 to $19,000. That means that 50% of all African American households in 2001 had $19,000 or less net worth. $19,000 or less in terms of net worth. Poverty, which is a very good measure. If we look at from 1974 all the way to the current time, this is the black rate for poverty, this is the non-Hispanic white rate for poverty. And there's some movement in, this, in these lines for a lot of different kind of reasons. But the stubborn differences between these lines persist over the particular top. This is what we mean by structural inequality, which exists in this particular society. There are large disparities in living arrangements. That is, we know from work by people like Anna Diaz Rule and others that neighborhood segregation has negative effects on people's health. We know that they're differentially stressful. Geronimus has done some very nice work on this and actually has done a couple of popular pieces in the New York Times, which are really interesting, which show this differential stressfulness between these particular environments. So as we begin to develop this affordance framework, let me start with the first part. So the environment, neighborhood effects, noise, poverty, urban areas, produces health, negative health outcomes and physical disorders. It's also very stressful and produces stressors in terms of job, family, financial, and relationships, which also has an effect upon the kind of physical health disorders that we see. So you can see what I'm talking about. Asthma, for example, or type 2 diabetes, or any other kind of outcome. And if you have people who are living in these arrangements differentially, then you're going to have differential outcomes over here in terms of physical health outcomes. But the neighborhood is not only something in that way. Neighborhoods also afford differential opportunities for people. And I mean this in the Gibsonian sense. That is, neighborhoods are not only things that produce stress or produce negativity, they also afford opportunities. 
for jobs or fast food outlets or liquor stores or illegal drug distributions and other kinds of things. If I live in certain neighborhoods, then I'm exposed to opportunities that I don't get by living in other neighborhoods. That's another important part of this. So neighborhoods afford the opportunities for poor health behavior. Neighborhood affords the opportunities. Um, liquor stores, <coughs> places where you can buy cigarettes, places where you can uh, do drugs, places where you can get bad food and overeat highly starched diets and so on. So poor health behaviors are afforded by the environments in this way. These two arrows are not about causality. These two arrows are about the affordances. Both the environment as well as the stressors actually afford these particular kinds of poor health behaviors. And we're going to be talking about why people then engage in those behaviors. So there are large disparities in all cause and specific cause uh, death rates. There are large differences in terms of infant mortality rates. And there are large disparities in health care utilization between African Americans and whites. So now I'm going to show you a few tables. And I could have shown you a million tables. And they all have the same pattern to them. So what I did was look at age differences. This is for one slice of a particular given year. So this is not developmental in any way. But they are the differences. So this is 18 to 24 years, 25 to 44 years, 45 to 64 years, and so on. What's really interesting about this slide is that look at the young years. They're very little in the way of disparities between African Americans and non-Hispanic whites in the early years. Disparities are a product of the life course. Disparities are a product of the life course. The longer African Americans traverse the particular life course, the more they're exposed to certain kinds of things, and the more likely they are to become sicker over the particular life course. Same thing for males. This is diabetes for males. Same particular, same particular effect. Same effect with regard to hypertension for females. Same thing for males. It's a product of the life course, and particularly middle age, by the way, I might add. So, but there are links from childhood, that's clear. Over the, black, over the life course, blacks live more than any other group in the fewest, the fewest years and have a higher proportion of those years in poor health. And health, race, ethnicity, and mobility are linked in very complex ways over the life course. So when I say the life course produces these outcomes, it's a very complex set of relationships that produces it. Controversy one. The rest of that wasn't controversial. This is controversial, though. And we don't have much proof of this, but I think this is true. Blacks may be more highly selected for positive health than whites early in life and late in life. So we buy the late in life, because everybody knows about the mortality crossover. So the older African Americans get, then the probability they're living longer for non-Hispanic whites. That's called the cross mortality crossover effect. And it's been observed a lot. But very few people have observed what I call the early life selection effect. This is everything before infant, mort after, before infant mortality and below. And what's interesting about this graph is that it, it, for early neonatal, neonatal, uh, fetal, late fetal, perinatal, at every single level, the death rates for blacks are much higher than the death rates for whites. If I had added spontaneous abortions in here, it would get the, exactly the same effect. They're very high. So all you have to do is to make one simple conclusion. If the weaker organisms are killed off, in comparison to the stronger organisms, then African Americans who make it to one year, one day of life are actually a superior organism than for whites who don't have to face the same color um, previous. And it's, it's very simple. It's a very simple assumption to make. And therefore, you get this really interesting graph. So these are endocrine, nutritional, and metabolic diseases over the time. Um, and if we look at this, this is infant mortality rates. This is the ratio now. So the more it's over one, the more it is that blacks are dying more than whites. So notice the big number. I showed you the, the slides before. But look what happens here. 
It's lower than one. Whites are more likely to die between the ages of one and four than African-American children are. They're just about equal from 10 to 14. And then you see from 15 to 19, they're just about equal. But look at what happens as you traverse the life course. You begin to move the middle. Age. Then you begin to see these big disparities that we talk about. And you only get an uptick. So this sigmoidal curve, by the way, this is for females, is very characteristic of this particular function. So the argument is that when black children are born, they make it beyond one year, one day of life. They're facing these particular stressors that I talked about before. Those stresses are pretty constant over the life course. And the organism, which begins very strong here, and therefore able to resist those particular kinds of stressors in comparison to whites, loses that as they traverse the life course. I know this is controversial, but this is controversial number one. If you think this is controversial, what do you see the rest of this talk? Anyway, so, and this is for male. It's exactly the same function. Exactly the same function as females. The same function. Isn't this interesting? Yeah. So what you're going to find is that the environmental affordances model, which I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes, predicted this. And that we were able actually to go through the data and to find this to be absolutely true. In fact, we're writing on a couple of papers on this right now. What's really interesting about this is you find some of the same hints in the data for all-cause mortality all-cause mortality, not just the specific reasons for death that I showed you before. It's really freaky. So poor health behaviors, now we, you know, we see the differences, we see the life course, we see the fact that disparities actually are very small or non-existent in early life. They begin really in middle age and they accelerate over the life course and then as blacks are selected out of that, then a hardier group is there and as they near 80 years of age, they actually live longer than whites. Gives you that sigmoidal effect. Poor health behaviors parallel exactly the disparities that we talked about before. This is smoking gum on female. Uh, these are black um, in, the, in the pink. And what's interesting about this is that they're, they're again, if anything, white, uh, white females exceed the rates of smoking for black females. But you get this really interesting effect over the life course. Increases. But for the most part, white exceeds it. Same thing with regard to males. In younger years, African Americans are not engaging in this particular set of behaviors. But particularly for males, and I'll tell you why, really right at the end of the talk, particularly for males, they are very vulnerable to these negative health behaviors in middle age and beyond, especially for males. Same thing with regard to obesity. And while obesity is not a behavior, it is a marker of behavior. So not a lot of difference with regard to males, but notice the difference with regard to females. In fact, obesity is one of the few kinds of things that we observe disparities early on. And what you see for African-American females is just almost an acceleration over the life course, so that by 40 to 59 years of age, nearly 6% of African-American women would be characterized as being obese, that is meeting the criteria for obesity. I'm here to tell you that there's a reason for that. There's a reason for this. It's not just um, lack, of, um, uh, lack of ability to turn down a meal or other kinds of things. There's a reason for it. And this obesity effect, by the way, is independent of social economic status. You get the same effect at low socioeconomic status, the same effect at moderate levels, the same effect at high levels of social economic status. It's not about social economic status. It's about something that the behaviors that blacks engage in, and black women particularly, over the life course. Vigorous physical activity, you see just the opposite issue. White um, women actually engage in more vigorous physical activity than black women over the life course almost at every single point. That's not true for, for, for males. African-American males actually engage in more at certain points in the life course than do white males. But notice what happens in older age. It drops off. There's a reason for that. This is heavy alcohol use. Trust me on these. I'm going to run fast. But exactly the same pattern that I showed you before for the other behaviors. 
drug use. Exactly the same pattern I showed you before for males. An uptick among African American males in middle age with regard to drug use and marijuana use, by the way, as well as smoking and the other things I talked about. So that's about physical health disparities and mortality. Let's talk about mental health disparities. In comparison to health statuses, mortality, and poor health behaviors, prevalence rates for most major psychiatric disorders reveal very few differences between blacks and whites. If anything, blacks have lower rates of these disorders than do whites. So household surveys over time, you got to take my word for it. I mean, I read all of these, and we contribute to some of these. But these household surveys have all found exactly the same thing. This is, this is not about poor measurement or poor assessment or whatever the case may be. Every one of these particular surveys, the NHANES, the National Survey of American Life, the NSC, the NCSR, the Epidemiologic Catchment Error Study, all these studies have shown exactly the same effect. For major depression and anxiety disorders, African Americans have lower rates of these disorders than do whites. And this just shows you for all these particular studies what the order of magnitude of the differences are. And these are not small differences between blacks and whites. This is not a function of minority states. Because for Hispanics, for every single category of classification, the rates are higher than the rates they are for whites. So it's not simply being in a minority status, it somehow is going to be protected. This is recent data that we have. We just published this. And you can see that, indeed, blacks, uh, African Americans and Caribbean blacks have um, lower rates than do whites. 12 months, if you don't like lifetime. 12 months, exactly the same effect. If you look over the life course, you see exactly the same effect I was talking about before. And it only at the end of the life course do you begin to get the switch. You begin to get the switch. And I'll explain that why you get that later. Same thing as for males. All right, so this is what I showed you before. This is the hypothesized relationship to psychiatric health disorders. We hypothesize, the literature hypothesized, that poor health behaviors, environment, stressors, and so on have effects on the psychiatric health disorders just like they do on the physical health disorders. The only problem with that, it doesn't work. The only problem with that is that it's just not true. Even though we've assumed that to be true, it's just not true. So why and what causes this? So what's important to look at is the interrelationship among physical and mental health disparities. It can give us a clue to what the sources of disparities are between these particular groups. So theoretically then, structural life inequalities are hypothesized to cause both health and mental health disparities. Structural life inequalities in income, wealth, employment, I showed you all these things, are large and unfavorable for blacks in this particular society. Physical health disparities and mortality are large and unfavorable for blacks in comparison to whites. Mental, order, mental disorder disparities in comparison are either the same or better for blacks. That is, lower rates than blacks. So it, it can't be true that the model I showed you before is true. It just can't be true. Why would indeed you get this particular effect? So we hypothesize then this particular set of complicated relationships that exist between physical health and psychiatric health disorders. And what we argue is that coping strategies in the face of non-race and race-specific stressors may themselves be harmful to people's health. The people that, things that people do in order to cope with the stresses in their life are actually harmful to their health. The second issue is great for psychologists, I hope, because we argue that stress-related precursors of serious mental health problems are more available to people's consciousness than are those of physical health problems. They're more available to the con your consciousness. So if you had a bad day, say you're a black faculty at the University of Massachusetts, just for the hell of it and you just had a bad day, you know, you know you had a bad day. How do you know it? I got a stomachache. I got a headache. 
I don't really feel good, and so on. I'm growing a tumor for cancer. How do you know you're growing a tumor for cancer? You don't. You don't at all. But if I'm under stressful conditions of life, there are feedbacks which allow me to do that. And all you have to do is hypothesize is that this psychological awareness motivates individuals to action. I am motivated to do something about that particular stress. I'm not motivated to do anything about that particular tumor because I don't even know it's there. So I'm motivated to do something. And so what will I do? Dahlman suggests that people eat comfort food to reduce activity in the chronic stress response network. That people eat comfort food. Twinkies are great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and they work. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I used to be a big smoker, big time smoker. I mean, like, you know, one of those three and a half pack a day guys, you know, and so on. So I don't care what you say. I'm going to come back to this too at the end. I don't care what you say. It, really, you feel better. I swear to God. Have a, couple, have a couple of martinis after a stressful day at work. You really feel better. Have some choose cheese doodles or whatever the case may be. Eat some potato chips. You know, eat, eat some ice cream. You actually feel better. Because all this work shows that it does reduce activity in the chronic stress response network. It does work. We propose that other behaviors, and our examination of the literature, I think, would support this, and review by a number of notable neuroscientists, actually, would argue that smoking, alcohol, and drug use have similar immediate effects to reduce the activation of the stress response network. And that's why people engage in these particular behaviors, and that's why we see the pattern that, that we see over the life course. So our argument is that these things contribute to this chronic activation of the HPA axis, these behaviors here actually interfere with the cascade of the psychiatric, poor psychiatric health. It actually buffers that relationship while at the same time contributing to higher rates of physical health disorders. Because what's wrong with smoking is bad for you. I mean, I know that. I mean, I was smoking my food right now, but it's bad for you, right? What's wrong with drinking alcohol? is bad for you. What's wrong with eating rich ice creams and other kinds of stuff? It's really bad for you. It really is. I mean, it makes you feel better, but it's really bad for you. All right? So we know that. So this is the model. This is the affordance framework that we're arguing that works in this particular arena. So we hypothesize these complex effects through the HPA axis between the endocrine and neurological systems. Under chronic stress, negative feedback breakdown, and there's continued release of CRF and cortisol. Long-term chronic, uh, chronic activation of the HP axis may be related to the etiology of some mental disorders, particularly depressive disorders, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders, which are the ones that we're focused on. But these have been highly, stress has been highly implicated in the etiology of these particular disorders, and we believe that to be true. This is some work by Dahlman would suggest, and the, and the bottom is the most important part. The stress response cannot remove the stressor, and you get consistently activated central response network. And this is very, very bad for you. So comfort foods aid in the shutdown of the stress response by inhibiting the release of CRF. Alcohol, nicotine, drug use stimulate release of dopamine and beta endorphins that also aid in the shutdown of the stress response, and they lead to feelings of relaxation and calm. They lead to feelings of relaxation and calm. Paradoxically, at the same time, these drugs may also further activation of the HPA axis, which we're looking at. Thus, individuals may be psychologically released from stress, but they are not physically released from the effects of stress. They just are not psychologically aware of what the effects are. So when you're under stress, as McEwen said here, it's important where you reach for a bag of potato chips or you go out for a jog or you go swimming. If you live in an inner city neighborhood, which is really awful, chances are high you're going to reach for the bag of potato chips, a bottle of liquor, or some drugs whether you're going to go out and go jogging or go down to the corner pool to go swimming, and so on. 
This, the environment affords the opportunities of the way in which you deal with stress. So we have two hypotheses. This is the one that my graduate students and postdocs favor, the weak one. So you know I don't favor that. So this says, <laughs> no, but they argue with me that you got no proof, James. I mean, they're really, they're really good. They, they keep me under control. So this one says, poor health behaviors mask the stress response cascade of neural and hormonal events that have long-term effects on the development of mental disorders. So this is happening to people over time, but it's being masked by the kinds of behaviors that people are engaging in. So you really don't know and you can't report on it. For those of you who know about anything to do with regard to the assessment of mental disorders, if you can't report on symptoms, then you can't become a case. That's the weak hypothesis. I, I don't like this hypothesis. I like the strong hypothesis, right? Right now, we can't distinguish it. The strong hypothesis says poor health behaviors through the action on the HPA axis and other brain hormones actually interfere with the cascade of neural and hormonal events that ordinarily would lead over time to mental disorders. This is the strong hypothesis. Right now, for a lot of reasons, we can't distinguish between these two, as you can well understand at this point. But that's the strong hypothesis. I just prefer it because it's strong versus weak, but you know, what the heck. So let me give you some examples of some work in the epidemiologic literature to try to test this particular hypothesis. So we're deriving hypotheses from this framework in a host of different kinds of studies. And I'm going to report on a couple big epidemiological studies to try to make the point and persuade you that indeed this makes sense. So this is an impoverished model. We had negative structural conditions and controls. We had negative, negative stressful events, not stress measured very well. We had poor health behaviors, which were simply a count of whether people smoke, ever smoke, whether they drink, and what their BMI was. We had self-reported health as one of our health outcomes. Poor chronic health for people who don't like self-reported health as another one. That is whether people have arthritis, lung disease, and so on. And we had DSM-3R depression, which was measured at wave two. So this is the relationship that, we, that we're testing. The relationship between structural life inequalities, chronic stress, behaviors, and physical health disparities. So what we find for whites and blacks is exactly the same for poor physical health outcomes, both self-reported health as well as for chronic conditions. What's interesting about this is that for blacks, we find another direct link where the behaviors that they engage in actually increase the probability of poor self-reported health and greater numbers of chronic conditions. The same thing is not true for whites. So that's a very, a very interesting outcome. This is a series of equations that we estimated for these individuals separately. If we look at psychiatric health disparities, we get this particular set of relationships, very similar to what we see with regard to the physical health ones. But in addition, we hypothesize that these behaviors, smoking, drinking, using alcohol, would buffer the influence of chronic stress on psychiatric health disparities. That's our argument, all right? And we're sticking with it. So what do we get? Well, I must have got something good, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking to you. Would I? Yeah, right. This is for whites. And this is actually what we thought was going to happen. So for whites, you get this kind of ordinal relationship. So the higher the stress that people are under, the more bad behaviors they're engaging, the higher the probability that they're a case for major depression. In fact, in some way, that's what we thought we would get when we started this whole talk. Right? You see the effect? It's very, it's very interesting. So this is unhealthy behaviors in three, under high stressful conditions, Typical buffering effect for those of you who work on social support. Uh, these are centered and all that kind of good stuff. We, we did it right. You get this particular effect. This is blacks. For blacks, on the other hand, who live under high levels of stress, if you don't smoke, if you don't drink, if you don't use alcohol, if you don't these things, then there's a high probability that you're going to suffer from major depression. Blacks who do all these things in greater numbers are much better off. It's 
smoking and drinking and all that kind of bad stuff is actually protective of your being a psychiatric case. Isn't that interesting? All right. I know you don't believe that. For whites, you get an additive effect. For blacks, you get a disordinary interaction. It's very true. African Americans who engage in these. We call this our perverse finding, because this is a perverse as hell, right? No doubt about it. You know, smoking and drinking and other things are really good for your mental health. But as I showed you before, it's really bad for your physical health. And that's why we think that blacks have a separate pathway that helps create the disparities that we observe in terms of physical health outcomes. But they're protected from the mental health things. Now, the one thing I'll say here, because I, I want this to get lost before the end of the talk, so I hope you'll forget I said this. Um, we believe that people would be more highly motivated to protect their mental health than they would be with regard to their physical health, both for the reasons I talked about before. But we really believe the notion of losing one's mind. Remember our friend back there, Dan Quayle, is such an awful thing. The thing about Alzheimer's, now that we've been looking at some various interesting kind of models, is that people lose their identity. And that people will do all kinds of things to protect that loss of who they are. You don't want to become schizophrenic. You don't want to become uh, bipolar. You don't want to become anxiety disorder, and so on. Now, for those of you who are skeptical, and I know there's no one out in the room who's skeptical. I saw one. So we said, can we replicate this particular effect? So we went to the Baltimore epidemiologic catchment area study. It's a longitudinal study. This is all the things about that study. I'm trying to hurry through that. You know, we kind of know what we're doing here. Um, not all the samples that we can find have both good mental health outcomes as well as good physical health outcomes. This one does. So this is whites. Same analysis, centered, high stress. For those individual whites, who engage in more negative health behaviors, the probability is higher that they would be a case of depression than it would be if they don't. This is the effect for blacks. Exactly the same outcome that we observed before. There's a lot of noise out here because of the numbers. But the fact is that that's exactly the effect that I just showed you in the previous sample. And these are independent samples, and we get exactly the same. This first article is coming out in the American Journal of Public Health in October, which lays this out. The second article by Mazur et al. is now under, um, under review on this same topic. It's really interesting. So in summaries, disparities in physical health and mental health exist. We don't know why. The law of small effect is very important. The differences between physical and mental health disparities are not easy to understand. But you really need to look at both of these together. There's been too much research where people have only been looking at physical health disparities and then make the claim that we expect to get exactly the same thing with a mental disorder thing. And it's just not true. So you have to have a model which can count for those. So one thing that may be accounting for those is the fact that these differences are mediated through the behaviors that some groups use to cope with the psychological consequences of living under chronically stressful life conditions. These behaviors are influenced by gender, by culture, and by environmental opportunities. And I showed you some data before, so let me give you the gender example. African females learn very early on who are living under stressful conditions, who are exposed to situations with regard to food preparation and other kinds of things. They really learn early on that comfort foods make them feel better. It really works. And they learned that early. They got the behaviors that work for them, and they just continue in those particular behaviors. And over time, you just get increased rates of obesity in those groups. They don't have to do other things. So for African American females, you see very low rates of smoking, of drinking, of drug use, and other kinds of things. And that's because they're eating. And it's having the same effect as smoking, drinking, and so on. Black males, on the other hand, are very active early in life. In fact, oftentimes, they get a lot of rhythm because they're so active. All right? So this exercise, by the way, 
And heavy exercise has the same effects through exactly the same symptoms, as does, by the way, hypersexual behavior as well, has exactly the same effects through the same system. These behaviors early on worked for them, and they continue to do it. But what happens when African-American males get to middle age? The knees go. You know, the leg goes. I, I just can't do those things anymore. I can't get out there and play basketball. I can't do that kind of activity. But the stresses of their life are still there, as I showed you before. So what do they do? They have to find another set of behaviors that have the same effect. That's why the reason that smoking, drinking, drug use actually go up in middle age for African-American males because they have to turn to it. But for females, they don't at all. They got, they got something that really works very well. That's what I meant about the fact that culture and gender and other things are going to have effects here in this. So chronically, so behavioral coping strategies in the face of chronic conditions, stressful conditions, that may be helpful in preserving African-American mental health, at the same time contributes, along with other kinds of negative structural conditions, to the observed physical health disparities and morbidity and mortality that we observe in these particular groups. That's my summary. And this effect may be mediated by the stress response network. Habitually attempting to relieve stress-induced dysphoric effects of the CRF may make one feel better, but it's likely to be bad for long-term health, all right? which we know. So blacks have these early learned, environmentally mediated effective coping strategies. These behaviors are effective in the way in which I think I've talked about, but they contribute along with poor living conditions, lack of resources, and environmentally produced chronic stress to negative race disparities in physical health and morbidity. It's complex, um, it's multifaceted, in fact, blacks and other groups in the society may buy their reduced rates of psychiatric disorders which higher, with higher rates of physical health morbidities and access and early mortality. 